Georgie, tell us a little bit about yourself. This is so weird. I'm like talking to this dark room. <laughs> like I feel like I'm on stage. Um, so my name is Georgie Spear. I'm a registered dietitian. I'm from the States. Um, grew up in New Jersey, went to Rutgers University, went to Cornell University in New York for grad school and my dietetic internship. Um, and then moved out to Colorado, met and fell in love with a Canadian, and here I am in Canada. So, um, so that's where it started. Uh, as for what I do now, I do nutrition coaching with uh, general public as well as athletes. And I run an online nutrition coaching company called One by One Nutrition. And I have a couple of books out, so I look forward to chatting with you guys today. From, from what you told me, your class has a pretty cool syllabus and it definitely took cooler than any classes that I have to take in summer school, so I think you're all off to a pretty good start. Um, you also told me that you guys would have some questions for me today, so I didn't have to talk the whole time. Is that right? You guys bring some stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that, that Jason and I talked about, uh, me sharing with you guys today, was some tips for how to keep a client uh, kind of motivated and just having a good productive relationship so you get good results from them without necessarily having to drive yourself into the ground trying to do it. So. Um, I should back up a little bit and tell you how I ended up in the career that I am in now. Obviously, working over the internet is, is a great thing. As you can see, I'm, I'm sitting at home drinking coffee uh, while a lot of people are at work. So it's a, it's, a good, it's a good gig to work over the internet, but most people can't start there. Usually, what you have to do is start in an established facility, such as a gym, a fitness center. If you're in nutrition, many people start in a hospital doing clinical nutrition work. And then on the side, if you build up uh, a readership through a blog or a website, then you may find that you can get into online coaching. And then it's a matter of shifting your ratio of uh, the more online clients that you can get, the fewer in person that you need to to pay your rent. So as, as you can switch that enough, uh, if you're good enough, lucky enough, and you have somebody help you with marketing, you can hopefully someday not to go to a facility and see people in person. Um, unless you like that sort of thing, in which case, by all means, go see people in person. Um, any questions on that, for starters? Any questions on online coaching? Yeah, so we have one. How much, oh. how much do you charge for online coaching? The question was, how much do you charge for online coaching? Uh, awesome question. So uh, what I do is, is nutrition, it's, it doesn't include fitness and workouts. So what we do is we offer various levels of service. So for one-on-one -on -one coaching, if somebody wants to um, you know, just work privately with me as a coach, it's 300 a month. And we talk on the phone every two weeks and it's unlimited email, so they can email me 10 times a day if they need to, but people don't need that. Um, I have coaches that work for me that I, uh, you know, I've trained and they work for my company, and it's less expensive to see them. So to work with one of my other coaches is 149 a month, so it's half price. And then we also do a group coaching format where people can, there's, it doesn't involve talking on the phone with a coach, but you kind of join a group and we have a private forum. And they get one behavior every two weeks to put into place and practice doing and there's a coach who answers all their questions and interacts with them in the forum, and that's 97 a month. So I can expect there's the most people in the, the group program, and then fewer in the one-on-one the -on -one program. So anywhere from 100 to 300 a month. Um, all right, cool. Any other questions you want me to just like keep going? Yeah, so we have another one. Um, cool, what's up? The question, yeah, the, the question was, the webcam is a little, the, uh, the microphone on the webcam is a little weak. The, the question was, what are the challenges of coaching online compared to in person? Is that correct? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I find there's some advantages to online as well, but, but the drawbacks of, of working online are 
that you, it can be tough to form a really good rapport with a client. Um, whereas in person, they see you smile, they see your energy. Uh, it's a lot easier to get that personal connection. So on the phone, it's a bit, uh, you, have to, you have to be a little bit more deliberate with like, okay, I'm really gonna try and be friendly to this person and I'm gonna look for the best in them, find out how their day was. And have, it, it just takes a bit more skill in terms of getting them talking. I wouldn't say it's a drawback as much as it's just a difference. Um, other than that, I find that it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good to be doing nutrition online. With uh, training and people that are in my circle that do you know, exercise prescription online, one of the big drawbacks is you can't watch someone's form. So you, it's tougher to correct somebody if they're doing something inefficiently, incorrectly, or dangerously. So um, many online trainers, they'll offer form correction uh, via video, which means the person has to get a video camera, take it to the gym, do, set it up, do their squats, and then get the feedback from you. So it's a bit, it's a bit cumbersome to try and do it that way. So a lot of people I know that that do exercise, you know, prescription or program development online will tell the person if they're having form troubles to either shoot a video or see if there's somebody local to check out their form and they just take care of the programming. Um, any others? Yes. Sarah. Um, do you find it harder for your clients to be accountable because you're online and you're not actually there with them talking in person or are they still pretty stuck to your what you prescribe? That's a great, uh, and I heard that one. <laughs> That's awesome uh, insight. Yeah, it's, it's different for a client to experience having a coach that's online versus someone that they're seeing on a regular basis, but I actually find that that's a benefit because the person takes more responsibility for what they're doing. You know, one of the things that uh, I talked a little bit about is internal motivation. You know, as you guys, you know, just know yourself and know other people and have tried to work with people, you can often get a feel for how some people, they, they're just gonna do this. They're gonna do this because it means something to them to take care of their health. They're, um, they're personally invested in it and no one's gonna stop them. And then there's other people that are really externally motivated and they're doing this because they really are getting pressure from a spouse or they go to a high school reunion or a wedding and they just wanna do it for that one thing. Their, their reason for doing this is, is very outside of themselves. And so those people will usually struggle more with compliance and they'll struggle more with being motivated. And it's a, a very real trap that sometimes a fitness professional or a trainer can be sucked into becoming somebody's motivation when in terms of like long-term, the best thing for that person, you actually don't want that. You don't wanna be the, the reason that this person is working out just to impress you, or the reason they're eating right is just so they can tell you. So um, what I find is favorable about working online is that it's really handy to remind people, I'm not gonna be there at the barbecue on Saturday, so do what you're gonna do and tell me about it and tell me how you feel about it. And it really, it separates the people that are uh, self-motivated from the people that are like, oh, I just want somebody to slap the donut out of my hand and they don't really want to take responsibility. So, um, did that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Uh, let's see, I wrote down some notes here. We, we, got, we got one more, if you don't mind. This makes my life easier, go ahead. All right, Lucas, go ahead. So I was on uh, your website and I was reading a little bit about how you guys use behavior modification to instill better realistic lifestyle changes in your clients. What's a, like an example that you could share that is uh, an example of behavior modification that you implement in a client's lifestyle, like sure. online. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed the tail end there. Just like that. online, like how do you implement it online and get them to actually follow through? Sure, we have um, kind of like a bank of different, you know, behaviors that are, are written up in, in lessons. Um, did you guys just turn the lights on? Because the screen looks dramatically different. Yes, it should take a moment. Your, yours is kind of bright, so it's actually working now. And plus they're talking, so I kind of want you to see them. Okay, cool. Um, so, some of the, the, obviously the change that we give somebody, I'm just gonna use one-on-one -on -one for an example. So I do an evaluation with people, they fill out an online assessment form, 
And what I get from that, I look at it and say, okay, what is the first most meaningful change that I want this person to make in terms of moving close to their goals? So um, for many people, they're eating when they aren't hungry. And for most of my clients, their main goal is weight loss. Excuse me. So I'll talk to them about you know, why that's happening. Are you eating because you think you're supposed to? Are you eating because you're sad? Are you eating because your boss yelled at you and you want to get it off your mind? Um, so we'll kind of look at non-hunger driven eating right off the bat with a lot of people. Um, other things that you know might be a behavior modification would be making sure that you get a good source of protein with each meal. Some people don't do that, especially breakfast. Um, other ones might be uh, looking at how many cups of fruits and vegetables you eat per day and aiming for one more than you got last week. So we set up an online tracker. So it's a glorified spreadsheet, basically. And then it has, um, you might have seen the screenshots actually, I think there are some on that Georgie. And it, it has their habits listed on the left side and then uh, across the top, the dates. So they can look and see, okay, July, you know, first, I did I eat my five cups of vegetables and I can put an X in the box? And did I get a lean protein and I can put an X in the box? Did I only eat when I was hungry and put an X in the box? So the one habit at a time thing is important because if you give somebody like six habits in a row, like I want you to eat vegetables, lean protein, only eat when you're hungry, uh, maximum two beers a week, and go to the gym six times. If you like give that all to somebody in one life overhaul package, it's, it's going to be a number of days before they're back where they started because they're just going to stop doing them. So it's deliberately slow to give people one at a time, but it ends up sticking much better and it's, it's much easier and less disruptive for someone's life. Any other questions at the moment? Yeah. Um, so you work with a lot of people that want weight loss, but do you also deal with people that have like disordered eating? Or like, how do you yes. want I missed the tail end of your question. Um, do, you, do you modify your behavior changes? Like, how do you, how do you deal with people that they don't eat enough for a disorder? Absolutely. Um, so one of the important things is knowing your, your scope of practice. And so as a registered dietitian, I am you know, legally suited to deal with people that have eating disorders. But given the confines of working online, I don't want to deal with somebody who has anorexia nervosa or active bulimia nervosa and the reasons behind that are because a visual exam is really important you know i want to be able to see if somebody looks like they're malnourished i want to be able to see if somebody's you know showing physical signs of deterioration and i can't do that online so if somebody fills out my assessment form and i get the feeling that they're um you know diagnosable as anorexia or bulimia, I will usually refer them to a medical doctor or a dietitian in their area. But as we know, the, the, the spectrum of disordered eating is like this big and people with diagnosable eating disorders is like this tiny sliver over on the end. And what's much more pervasive than the type of clients that I do deal with are people that have various uh, characteristics of disordered eating, such as they've been on a diet for their entire life and they're just becoming afraid of all these different foods or people that have uh, binge eating disorder. I do work with people who have that. Um, so I guess your question was, what types of things do I do with them? Is that correct? Yeah, like do you have different like habit things that you do with them? Like or, yeah, I, I mean, the same set of habits is not applicable to all people. So when somebody, for example, has, let's say no way to lose, you just want to have a healthier relationship with food and get off the, the diet merry-go-round. Um, we'll talk about using hunger to guide your eating. So one of the habits that I use for people in weight loss is to feel hunger for about 30 to 60 minutes before each time you eat. That's a really reliable way to get somebody into enough of a calorie deficit to lose some weight without you know, really going into a big calorie deficit. So if somebody doesn't need to lose weight, I'm not going to tell them to be hungry for 30 to 60 minutes. We'll usually talk about just verifying that you are hungry and you know a, a feeling centered in your abdomen as opposed to I want something crunchy, I'm craving something sweet, I might be thirsty. Um, so just verifying that you're actually hungry. Um, other things that are different would be if somebody you know comes to me and they have 
symptoms or, or characteristics of disordered eating, a lot of times they have more kind of mental and emotional homework to do, such as getting in touch with, it kind of, it one flows into the other. If you're trying to figure out when you're hungry so that you can eat, you often will realize, okay, there's all these things going on that are at hunger that make me want to eat, and kind of one by one we can develop the emotional vocabulary to figure out what's thirst, what's hunger, what's sadness, what's stress, and, and deal with each of those appropriately. So uh, I would say it gets more and more mental and emotional as we get into some of the, the more um, psychological kind of mind games that can happen with, when people are suffering from those conditions. In terms of actual nutrition, it's really important to make sure that people eat enough when they're trying to overcome binge eating because often what happens is people are over restrictively dieting for a period of time and then the binge naturally happens because they're physically underfed and their uh, their body's just crying out for fuel. So I think they go hand in hand. You have to make sure somebody has you know adequate nutrition base to support them and then also kind of working on the the, the personal stuff too. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Oh if nobody's got questions I got you know some more tips and stuff that I can give you guys. So when you're working with somebody, and I know most of you may not be nutrition specialists, but also in the exercise field, which is where I started too. Um, right when you start working with somebody, I think it's really, really helpful, and one of the most common mistakes is to skip the fact that you want to set a tone of non-judgment with your client. I think right from the get-go, if you tell them, um, hey, if you come to me and you're having you know, trouble trouble getting your workouts in, if you're having trouble getting that stretching in, if, if you're finding it hard to stick to the nutrition tips that we talked about, just let me know. It's cool. I'm not going to you know, slap you in the face or run around screaming that you're the worst client ever. Because a lot of times, clients feel like they have to perform for us, that they have to show up and tell us, you know, I kicked ass and took things all week. I did everything you told me. And if they don't, they worry we're going to, you know, uh, look down on them. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen this, but did you ever see a trainer in a big box gym or something belittle a client? Anybody? Yeah, yeah just a little bit. <laughs> I've definitely seen it. I've seen trainers be like, oh man, I can't believe you did that. Why would you eat ice cream when you already have brownies? Like seriously, do you want this or not? And they'll say it loud enough that other people in the gym can hear it. I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> don't do that to your clients. So, um, Setting that tone really, not only is it nice, it is going to enable you to be more effective because every client is going to struggle unless you're just really baking them and giving them ineffectively easy things. If you're helping someone change, there will be struggle. And if you have set the standard that you're judging people and will punish them or make fun of them or be hard on them when they struggle, they're not gonna tell you the next time they struggle. So they'll come back and they'll say, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, it was an off weekend, but I'm back today. You know, they won't tell you details because they just don't want to hear your criticism. So um, if you kind of set that up right from the beginning that they can tell you anything, uh, if you share stuff about your own life, like, hey, I had some extra dessert at the 4th of July barbecue too, you know, let's, let's keep, keep it real. None of us are going to be perfect. That goes a long way too to making you relatable to your to your clients. Any of you guys ever feel like, oh, I'm going to be a professional. I better be perfect in my nutrition and fitness. Yeah, a little bit. See a couple of heads. I definitely did. I was I was feeling like I had to be the pinnacle. I, I better eat every meal healthy and never put a slice of pizza on Instagram or Facebook because people would be like, oh, she's she's a fake. And I learned that when you start telling people hey, I actually ate too much and, and got a little belly and come back on track too, that people respect you for it. And they find that you're walking in the same room they are, that you're not immune to the challenges of, you know, smelling the Cinnabon in the airport. And you're much more relatable. So, um, let's see what else I got here. Another thing that's handy that a lot of trainers and uh, fitness professionals don't necessarily do with their clients is, giving them choices. So when it's coming down to uh, a nutrition strategy, I'll have suggestions. I'll say, you know, I have a couple ideas here for areas in which I think we could make some progress. And, uh, 
uh, you know, get things moving for you. But I'm interested in your input. Do you feel like it would be easier to look at the number of meals you're eating per day? Or do you think it would be easier to look at the content of those meals? And sometimes the client will have a really strong opinion and say like, oh man, I'm just not sure about that one. I really want to do that one. Or, oh, protein is going to be way easier for me than looking at my carb intake. Let's do protein first. And letting your client have some input on what they want to do first, what they want to do second, can, can go a long way because when they choose it, they're going to do it more reliably. It's, it's just more effective than if they come in and you say, okay, here's what you're doing now. So in a workout context, you can enable your client to have some more choice by saying, hey, I really want to hit your posterior chain. Uh, but there's a couple ways we can do that. Which one do you want to do? We can do this or we can do this. And let your client make some choices. It sounds like it's, it's a small deal, but it ends up making the workout much more enjoyable for the client and it, it keeps them active in uh, taking a responsible role in their fitness. They're not just showing up and surrendering all responsibility to you. They're, they're making choices. They're part of the process. So, can anyone else think of a, a way that you could give your client a choice at some point? I'm gonna make you guys talk. <laughs> so you all, you all work with your clients for uh, six total sessions where you train them. Does anyone have an example where they gave their clients a choice? Maybe their client really didn't like doing something. And hey, Earl, go ahead. So we had our client doing the front squats, and then she was not really like comfortable with it. Like her shoulders were hurting, all of her technique was pretty good. So we kind of adjusted it and like added her to box goblet squats and asked if she's comfortable with that. She said yeah. So that's close enough. Perfect. Yeah, I mean that's a great example. Front squats are something that you can do for a lot of people, either the elbows, the wrists, the low back, something bugs them when you do a front squat. So yeah, switching to a goblet or something else, it's, it's so much better than forcing your client to do the exercise that you had in mind. Um, because you're honoring their discomfort and remembering, you know, eventually these are the people that are paying your bills. <laughs> you want to take care of them, you want to you keep them happy. So um, yeah, it's a great, great one there. Um, let's see. At every step of making a change or proposing something, it's a great idea to solicit some feedback. Like, how's that feeling? If somebody's quiet, try and get something out of them. How's that feeling? Does that make you uncomfortable? You know, your, your knee was bothering me last week. Is that doing okay today? Um, and then after I have somebody make a nutrition change, I'll often ask them, like, hey, I see on your tracker, you, you nailed those veggies all week. That's awesome. Uh, how hard was it? Because if somebody says, this was like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I want to be careful with what we do next because it's it's still very challenging for them. I may not want to give them something new to do. We may want to work on, okay, let's find a way to make this a little easier so that you can keep doing it forever. Because if it's the hardest thing you've ever done, I'm amazed you did it for seven days and you might not be able to keep doing it. So let's, let's find a way to make this easier. Um, maybe you don't have to grow all your vegetables yourself uh, or you know, <laughs> cook them in really fancy ways. Maybe we can make it easier with some pre-cut vegetables or, you know, some frozen vegetables. Anything that's not going to make it quite so hard. But if somebody says, hey, this is like super easy, then you know you can give them something a little bit more challenging, you know, for the next step. So stay in tune with the challenge level of how, how things are going with their clients, whether it's uh, nutrition or fitness. And I think that, that goes a long way, too. Um, Let's see, so the last, last point I kind of had was if somebody comes back and they're, they're low success, either they're, they're not doing their workouts or they're not sticking to their nutrition or they're not showing up for sessions, there's three things that I, I tell the coach that worked for me to do. And that's you either want to shrink the change or shrink the difficulty of what you're asking them to do or you want to remove a barrier by finding out what's in their way and seeing how you can work together to get it out of their way. Or you want to add a tool, you know, give them some strategy that helps them overcome that challenge. So if somebody's saying, oh, my kids keep, you know, messing with my schedule, I can't, I can't 
get to the gym because I gotta drive them here, there, and everywhere. Okay, well we can either shrink the challenge by talking about workouts they can do at home, or remove a barrier by saying, well hey, do you have someone that'll babysit? Oh, there's childcare here at the gym, or maybe we can move your sessions to a different time of day so you can get to the gym. Um, or adding a tool uh, might fall into the first two categories in that example, but um, you know, giving them some strategies to say, hey, it's okay to leave your kids with your husband for a while. Um, so, so a few things to think about there if you do have somebody that's struggling. The one pseudo answer that's not really a good answer is to just try harder. So please don't don't tell your clients to try harder. Um, sometimes they will say to you, I just I just need to try harder, and that's not a great example of uh, a solution either. Odds are we're all trying every day. So. Um, if somebody says, I just need to try harder, I can push them and say, well, let's figure out what you can do differently. Um, so that's all I've got prepared, but I'm more than happy to answer questions as long as you guys got them. I've got uh, half an hour before i got to get off for my next client, so I am all yours to hit with questions. I have a question. All right, so the myth is always it's better to eat multiple small meals throughout the day rather than three large meals. You design a lot of nutrition plans, so what, what is your take on that? If somebody is trying to gain weight, it's better to do multiple meals because it's easier to get the calories in. Anybody that's ever tried to do a bulking cycle or you know deliberately gain weight knows that it becomes very hard to eat more calories at some point. So splitting them up into small meals is good. Um, and then if they can't get them all in solid food, making some of them liquid. So shakes, smoothies, or juice is another handy way to get calories in. If someone's trying to lose weight, it's the opposite. It's better to keep it to three or four feedings because that is more satisfying appetite-wise. So let's say um, I know that somebody's caloric needs are, let's say, 1,800 calories for weight loss. If they eat six meals that are 300 calories, there's a certain level of challenge associated with that. I mean, eating a 300 calorie meal does not come naturally to anyone. You know, none of us are like, oh, I'm hungry, and then 300 calories later are like, I'm good now. You know, there's, there's a, a level of restraint that goes on in a meal that small. Every girl was like, yes. <laughs> so um, if you take that same person that's really struggling to stick to six 300 calorie meals, and you say, let's, let's do three meals, 600 calories, 600 calorie breakfast, 600 calorie lunch, 600 calorie dinner. They'll usually say, oh my God, that's so much food. I don't think I can eat it all. Um, and then they'll try it and say, you know, I was so satisfied and full and I was never hungry and I can't believe that this actually works. So um, that's one of the biggest myths is that the best way to lose weight is to do small frequent meals. It's actually better to eat substantial meals, get fully satisfied and have a gap before your next meal where you're not thinking about food. So that's actually the first habit in my book is if you're trying to lose weight to not eat many meals, to eat satisfying meals so that you can fake them out. Is that a race questions for anybody? I know that's, that's usually a bit new for people. Yeah, I was always like, I always heard that by eating multiple meals throughout the day, it keeps your metabolism high, so you burn more calories throughout the day because of that. So like, how does, how does the metabolism work in the scenario that you're saying that still makes you lose weight? Sure. It's, uh, it, it, recent studies in the last few years have shown that that was never actually true, that the you know, basal metabolism doesn't change. Your activity level doesn't, you know, your calorie expenditure from activity doesn't change. And the thermic effect of food, or the calories that your metabolism jumps when you eat, jumps in proportion to the amount of food that you eat them. So if you're eating uh, 300 calorie meals, you'll get about a 10% you know, uh, bump. So you'll burn about 30 calories in the thermic effect of food from that meal. But if you eat a 600 calorie meal, you're gonna burn 60. So it's, it's no more metabolically you know, expensive to eat in small meals or large meals. It tends to be exactly the same. Where there's a difference is in how they register to your brain. 
to this central appetite regulation mechanisms, they're not, so you have all these signals that are saying we're hungry, we're hungry, eat. And when you eat a small meal, only a few of them get turned down, nothing gets turned all the way off. So people who are doing small frequent meals, they exist in what I call a hunger purgatory. You're like, I'm not really hungry, but I'm not really full. I'm not really hungry, <laughs> I eat my yogurt, I'm not really full. Whereas if you eat a, a substantial meal, all of your hunger signals get turned off. You're actually like, huh, what am I gonna do today? I'm not gonna sit here and think about food for a few hours. It's like newfound freedom for people that have been, been dieting for a long time. And uh, it's just a lot more, it's perceived as a lot more satisfying by the brain to get uh, kind of critical mass of food into each meal. So the difference is purely in the appetite regulation, not in the calorie expenditure. Yeah, yeah. Is it a challenge like tacking in or finding like older clientele since you're technology based? Like, is it like um, hard for? Just, just a little louder. Is it like a challenge or is it like a, much of a struggle finding like older clients since you're technology based and like everything over the computer? Like. I I I'm so, not hearing every word of that question. I heard is it a challenge or something? This question was: Is it a challenge to find older clients since you are technology based? Um, I guess it, it, it self-selects. Most of my clients are between 35 and 50 years of age, but uh, there's plenty of people in the 50s to 60s demographic that are also online. Um, as people get above that kind of age group, they don't seem to care about weight loss anymore. Um, <laughs> I really hope I'm not 88 years old and being like, oh, I hope I look at my bikini this summer. <laughs> I hope I have like more meaningful things going on. Um, it tends to be the internet using demographic is the one that that wants to eat for you know weight loss. And when people are in an older demographic than that, they they do still need nutrition help, but it tends to be from a medical standpoint. Um, they're rehabbing from an injury or they're recovering from a procedure or they're trying to prevent a second heart attack. So that's usually where the medical system comes in and insurance is paying for everything. So they're not gonna go for an online dietitian anyway. So yeah, I guess it is a niche market to have the internet using age. clients that are like looking for weight loss how many do you actually get looking for like weight gain not too many um every every uh, people that are looking for weight gain are usually um looking to gain weight for a specific sport or for uh bodybuilding competition or they're just genetically really really slim and they don't want to be so slim <laughs> so uh Usually they don't tend to gravitate towards my services because it's not what I specialize in. I do work with a lot of endurance athletes. So um, I have a number of runners who are very, very slim and want to have a little bit more muscle and a little bit more power so that they, they can do better on hilly segments of races. So I do get some endurance athletes with that, but I, I, don't, I think people that want to bulk up tend to go for bulkier male coaches <laughs> and not me. So. Um, there's definitely a persona there. I think uh, Jason was saying he had Lane Norton. Did he talk to you guys or another section? He talked to last semester's class. Yeah, so Lane would definitely be more um, of somebody that specializes in muscle gain for people. I think he works with a lot of physique athletes. Um, so one thing that you'll, you guys will learn is as you get into your career, you don't have to know right now, oh, I want to work with a specific population, but a lot of people do, um, they find a segment or a segment finds them. And that's who you start getting referrals from. And that's where your reputation spreads. And hopefully it's a segment that you like working with. Um, and so so I have a lot of you know winter endurance athletes because I work with some uh, winter Olympians. And so you know, I don't have the summer athletes calling me, but the winter people all seem to share training camps. So one talks to another, talks to another, 
and then I get you know half the biathlon team in Canada on my roster. So um, other women that I know, they they run online coaching, fitness and nutrition for moms, and they talk about the unique challenges of you know managing childcare and having a job and you know trying to secure your own needs. Um, so yeah, people do kind of segment off into different different areas. People that are numbers based that want a meal plan don't end up working with me because they don't gravitate toward my approach, which is very grounded in behavior. And I get people that don't want to diet anymore. So that's kind of my segment. Like, are you done counting calories? Awesome, come my way. Let's talk about how you can get lean and not count calories anymore. Some people are like, I want to count calories. I'm not, I'm not seeing her. I want to go find someone who's going to tell me how many calories to eat and watch my macros every day. So different services out there for different people. What does your typical day look like? Oh, uh, every day. Every day is different. Um, I wake up, I come out here, I have breakfast with my husband. My husband is around the corner in the office right now because we both work from home. We, we co-own this company. Um, after breakfast, I answer emails for half an hour to an hour until my first call. My first call is usually 10 o'clock, so I don't have to start too early. I do uh, client calls at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock, and I put calls on each hour, but I, I generally take the first call with the client is the whole hour, but follow-ups are 30 minutes. So that means that I often get a break between calls, and that's when you refill your coffee, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, um, answer a couple more emails, or hop on Facebook, because I have uh, a couple of Facebook groups that I run as well, so there's always stuff to be done around the internet. So break at one for lunch. I have an hour to cook and eat lunch, because one of the best parts of working at home is you can make a home cooked meal every day for lunch. Uh, I might grab a walk after lunch or lay down for a bit. And then I start working again around three o'clock and I will take three more client calls in the afternoon. So 3.30, 4.30, Sometimes I'll squeeze a fourth one in. I stop at six for another home cooked meal. Um, and then if I had a good work life balance, I'd stop working then, but I don't. <laughs> so full admission, I will usually go back to work and work, uh, finish dinner around 7.30 and then I'll work until eight or nine. If there's no UFC on, if there's UFC, I, I stop and watch UFC. Um, otherwise, I, uh, that would be, you know, go to my client forum. I, I don't, I have someone who coaches my group program, but I hop on there and I just read the forums and make sure things are going well. Answer more emails, because I get like 40 or 50 a day. Uh, go back on Facebook, work on my groups there. Um, and then on weekends when I don't have client calls, I just spend the day doing outreach stuff. So uh, working on promoting my book. There's a book, you'll see it in the bookstore. See this face? It's easy to find. I'm like right on the cover of my book. <laughs> so uh, doing interviews, doing podcasts, um, promoting the book, doing all that stuff, writing talks. I go to conferences and present. Um, I coach some coaches on how to improve their practices and get better connection and results with their clients. So it's very flexible. As you can tell, you can, you can work a lot of hours if you want to, but I can also pair it back. And you know, I took five days off and went to California for a conference a week or so ago. So I can take breaks too, but I often find that when there's a lot of stuff to be done, it's, it's really gratifying and enjoyable to you know, make hay while the sun shines and then you know, take breaks every now and then and take a five day weekend, so. How many clients do you actually deal with, like personally? Personally, uh, one on one, I've gotten as high as 55, completely burned out and hated life and dialed back. So I know the upper limit is like, don't go above 55, it'll lose your mind. Come back to um, around 35 right now, one on one. Um, so that means, because I talk with everybody every two weeks, so that means 35 calls every two weeks. So divide that in half. It's easier to divide 36 in half. Um, so that tells you how many calls, so four to five calls a day it works out to be. I have six slots, but one of them will often end up being with 
a journalist, an interview, or a podcast recording. So uh, five to six calls a day. Uh, if you do more than that, you just burn out. It just gets to be too much, I find. So I personally take 35. Some coaches that work for me take more like 20, so they have more of a, a part-time thing. In the group coaching, and this is, of course, one of the benefits of doing things in groups, just like personal training, you can take more people. So one coach can handle about 60 people in an online group. So you know the rate comes down, but your bandwidth becomes so much greater. So um, it's a consideration when you're planning out your own career that if you want to start from the get-go working with groups of people, there's, there's capacity to make more money and help more people. Um, it just becomes a challenge to recruit that many people. When you were setting up your online business at the beginning, what was the biggest challenge in getting your promotion out there? And how did you overcome that to get clientele? It takes a lot. There's so much on the internet. You know, if you put in like online personal training, you're going to get hundreds and hundreds of people. If you put in online nutrition coaching, kind of the same problem. So um, when I started, I already had a big following me, from AskGeorgie.com. I ran AskGeorgie.com completely on the side while I was in grad school and working in hospitals to develop a following and didn't even intend to make a business out of it until it just made a business for me on the side. So I would say if you want to you know, start going online, you can't start a blog too early or network on Facebook, write articles, um, put together an ebook. You don't even have to write like, a big book, but put together stuff that you know, stuff that you're good at. Write it and capture it somewhere because that becomes your marketing. You know, Nowadays, a lot of people do more with content marketing than you know, paying Google to slap your ad somewhere. So we don't do any paid advertising. We just focus on good content. So writing articles and then sharing those articles, inviting your followers to share those articles. A lot of people use Instagram um, and getting people to share your stuff that way. Write stuff that's good enough that people want to show it to someone else. And uh, then it's almost like free advertising. So. I do a lot of that. Um, yeah, I grab your followers through a blog, great way. Starting to price low helps, just to get more people priced is a, is, uh, a very realistic deterrent. People can't afford you, they're, they're not gonna work with you. So starting to get price lower helps you to get more people and get more experience, and then you get better. So then you can raise your price and hopefully still be attracting more and more clients. Um, networking with other people is great. Get on Facebook. Get on, on Twitter, make connections. If you can travel and go to conferences, go to conferences, because you're going to meet people that are more established in the industry, and they can help you, and you can learn from them. So most people are pretty, I don't know, I, I, I guess I, I'm nice, so I, I hope I attract nice people, but I have found people are very open with sharing, like, hey, this worked for me, this worked for me. Don't waste your time doing this. Um, and that's, that's gold, because otherwise we have to make all the mistakes ourselves, and that can take a while. How long do your clients stay with the program, like on average? Um, let's see. So the group program is the easiest because that's it's kind of a set timeline. We do 12 habits for two weeks each, so it ends up being six months. And then they have the option of continuing to level two. Um, so. That's kind of like a, a, a transition point there. So I'll say the average is about six months. Some people stay longer, some people don't stay the whole six. Um, in terms of one-on-one, -on -one, there's a really, really large spread. Um, the shortest is typically three to four months. And that would be a simple case like an athlete that just needs help with figuring out their pre and post workout nutrition and how much to eat on a four hour bike ride. You kind of you give them information and they say, okay, thanks, I'm good. Um, the more complicated somebody's situation is, the longer they need. Um, so if somebody's, and it, it's not about the amount of weight they have to lose either. You know, if somebody's, sometimes 
people will be relatively simple cases that need to lose large amounts of weight. And then it's just a matter of let me give you the behaviors that you need, maybe three months, maybe four months. And then they're like, awesome, I'm losing one half to one pound a week. I'm going to keep doing this, and I'll shoot you an email when I hit my goal weight. And you're like, awesome, rock on. Um, sometimes people do say, I have people that, that were with me on July 15, 2012, when I opened my doors and will not leave. <laughs> they just they don't want to uh, cut the ties, and they really enjoy talking on the phone with me every two weeks. And it's, the one person in their life that is going to check up on them and say, hey, are you doing your workouts? Did you go see your doctor for that that thing that you mentioned? Did you, uh, are you eating your vegetables? And they really like having that as, as somebody just to converse with specific conversation every two weeks about your health care activities and if you're doing them. So um, I find the timeline really, really ranges. If younger people tend to stay for less time simply because of the budgetary crunch. As people get older, they tend to have you know a bit more expendable income, and then they're like, hey, if I like this, let's keep doing it. So how do you uh, regulate your numbers as far as people coming in and people falling out? Uh, so you don't get too overwhelmed. That was actually how I ended up with employees. Because at first I was like, hey, the more the merrier, I'll keep taking them. And then you end up with like 50 or 60 people in your life, like, I can't do this all. So I actually had somebody that was on my roster who was coaching people herself. So it was like, I was helping her and she was helping other people. And it was like, it seemed like a natural transition to hire her. And then when uh, somebody else came on my radar that was a coach I was mentoring, she said, I wanna, I wanna be a nutrition coach. I wanna learn what you do. And you know, I worked with her for about a year and I saw she's awesome. I wanna hire her too. So they've been with me for a couple of years now. So I get clients to them. And then I have a couple, you know, people people rise up in your network. People find you and say, hey, I want to work for you. You have a lot of clients and have a good network here. Um, so I have I manage my personal client load by handing off to other coaches. And the price discrepancy was a necessary point, or was necessary at some point because I had Working with all of us is $150 a month and we just put you with whoever. But people kept saying, okay, your face is on the website, I want to work with you. Um, and I needed to find people to give to my other coaches, that's why I have them. So I had to put a, a price discrepancy. So now it's more money to work with me. So people are more inclined to say, hey, she trained these people, she has faith in them, she works, she's trained them for years, they do the same system as she does, one habit at a time, the habits are the same, I think I'll work with somebody else for half price. Um, that, that works as well. So there's a few ways to manage it. If you find you're getting overwhelmed, it's a good problem to have. Uh, you can probably ask for a little more money um, and kind of manage it that way. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. What's one mistake that you made in the beginning that you learned from or one take on? Ever. 
Um, I also learned that when you're inquiring about someone's thought process, like somebody is it an actual actual Facebook dialogue. Somebody put in, uh, I found myself eating a blizzard uh, at DQ. I feel horrible about it. Dot dot dot. And one of the the mentors got in there and said, "What were you thinking ordering the blizzard?" He's actually trying to ask what was going on in your mind, but when you read that, what were you thinking ordering the blizzard? You feel like, <laughs> I wanna hang my head. So uh, sometimes you learn when you work online and with a lot of email that you have to watch your words a lot more because people people don't see you saying, hey, it's cool, you know, smiling friend. Hey, what, what was on your mind? All they hear is, what were you thinking? <laughs> you open that email, so. Um, can't forget too much else. I, I take payments through PayPal. I experimented with going through uh, a different credit card company for a while, and they advertised rates that were much better than PayPal. So I switched all my people over to this other credit card system, and then they I got my first statement from them, and it was like three times the advertised rate. Uh, so that was a that was a headache, and I had to gradually switch people back over to PayPal. So little business things um, that you learn and you just kind of keep trucking. I, I spent uh, several thousand dollars on a website design that just didn't come out the way I wanted it to, so water under the bridge. You just you keep going and, and you try to pick a designer better next time. So I guess the people that you work with sometimes, you can be you can make mistakes in working with the wrong people, so you want to be, be careful about who you connect with. How do you transition a client from you mentioned you have clients with high external motivation, wanting to get in shape for a wedding or class reunion or whatever. How do you help them find internal motivation? How do you try and transition it into something more sustainable? Sure, sure, that's a, an awesome one. Um, a lot of times we, we're coaching our clients with every single interaction. So, what you give positive feedback on gets reinforced. So when somebody posts in the Facebook group, I had the most amazing weekend. I, I went to this barbecue and I didn't graze my face up like I always do. I stuck to one alcoholic beverage and drank water. And then I got on this scale this morning and I am down three pounds. Yay, go me. I will not comment on the weight loss. I will say, I will, I will positive reinforcement of the behaviors because that's what you actually want to reinforce and I'll say oh my god this is so awesome there were so many opportunities for you to go back to your old behaviors and obviously it was important enough to you keep in mind your nutrition goals I love that you did that that's awesome and you seem like it feels really good so you, you reinforce this process is seeming like it feels really good for you um, because their minds may be just looking to the scale, looking to the scale um, for that kind of external validation. So I kind of try and be the, the balancing point and I'm like, wow, look how good you feel, look how proud you are of yourself. That means something. And that's not something we want to give up after this wedding date. Like clearly taking care of your body is giving you good feelings. So, um, so I think what you reflect and what you reinforce can have a really powerful impact there. Um, an easy strategy is to keep asking people how it's feeling, like um, as opposed to, oh, your, your pants are fitting looser. How many inches are they now? I'd say, oh, your, your pants are looser, you told me. That's, that's awesome. Uh, how are you feeling? How's your energy level? How's your mood? Um, when, the, when they notice that those things are better, it just becomes natural to want to feel good and to not want to go back to feeling bad. So I think it, it kind of helps with perpetuating the behavior. Is that helpful? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Twenty-eight. All right. I Seems like people are running out of questions. <laughs> yeah, I think we're pretty close to uh, to one thirty-two. Yeah. Well, any any final uh, any final questions? 
Did she go to the game? Did you go to the game? World Cup. World Cup. Did you go to the World Cup? I did not, but you could hear it from here. Wow. You could hear it, yes. Um, the my husband was actually at a, a pub across the across the water, there's like inlet in Vancouver. And uh, he said he couldn't he couldn't hear the people at his table because <laughs> the stadium is, you know, really close and uh, yeah, you couldn't, couldn't hear. So it was it was it was pretty epic. Pretty epic. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Any any final remarks for the class? Closing statement. Awesome. Thanks so much for uh, sharing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Let's see if my face is going to do anything. <laughs> Thank you. We'll uh, no I'll touch base with you through email. You got it. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you.